God is so good. So uh, I was kind of, had no idea what, what I was going to talk about this week, and that's awesome. That's always scary. Um, but as the week went on, um, the Lord did what the Lord does, and, and he, he showed some amazing things. And I, and I can't say that this is necessarily a, a message that was put together, uh, you know, to, to give as a message. Again, uh, so many times as we're walking with the Lord, uh, we get the opportunity to preach the gospel with the way that we live our lives and not so much by what we say. And, uh, and, and I feel like the Lord, uh, he wanted me to share, what I'm going to share today is basically a conversation that I've been having with the Lord all week. And, uh, and it was an internal conversation. It's not a lot of the things that I've spoke out loud. Um, I spoke a few of the things out loud to my lovely bride, and, uh, you know, she's awesome. She's always encouraging and, and, a, and a listening ear, and uh, I don't know about y'all, but walking with the Lord, you know, sometimes is extremely exciting, and other times it is extremely frustrating, and, uh, you know, the two go hand in hand, you know. God is the God of, you know, the mountaintops. He's, he's, he's the God when everything is going our way. He's also the God of the valleys. He's also our Lord, our Savior, our everything um, during times of trials and tribulation. And and I think I have a have a title uh, for this finally. And uh, the title isn't that great, but just bear with me. The the title is feeling hopeless, feeling hopeless. And and again, uh, this is where I have been over the course of the last week. Uh, And I feel like the Lord just wanted me to share my heart and what he's brought me through over the last few days. And uh, so, you know, we all know that, uh, you know, we have a new uh, president, and and I'm I'm struggling with that. I should not be struggling with that, but I'm struggling with that. And so the first order of business before we actually get going into the Word is I just want to take a moment, and uh, not because I want to, because that's what my father tells us to do. Lord, I just lift up President Biden to you. Lord, and you have placed him in the seat of the president over this nation. And Lord, your word, you tell us to pray for our leaders. So Lord, I just pray for him. I lift him up to you. Lord, and I ask that you would, you would help him as he makes decisions governing and directing this nation. Lord, I ask that you would encounter him. I ask that you would place people around him that would continually point him to you. I ask that you would open his eyes to your truths, to your plans, your purposes. Lord, I ask that you would, I ask for a salvation. Lord, I ask that you would save this man's soul. And uh, Lord, there's nothing that happens outside of your control. You knew this was going to happen. Um, your ways are not our ways. And uh, Lord, I just ask that you would help us to recalculate or refocus our vision and our sights on you, that we would not put our hope in, in man and government, um, in ourselves even, but in you. And so, Lord, I just, I just ask that you would help this man. I ask that you would protect him. I ask that you would bless him, and I ask that you would save his soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know how to preface this. This is, this is a weird thing. Usually I have pages and pages, and I just have a couple little things, which is really unusual for me. Um, but I've went through a week here of feeling hopeless. And um, that's, I didn't share that with a lot of people. I didn't share that with anybody, really. I just was in myself going, what are we going to do now? God, how can you let this happen? I mean, we, I... I, we, my brothers and sisters, I would have to say that I've recognized in the course of the last six months, I don't think I've ever seen such a push for people praying for our nation as what I've seen in the last six months. And there's been uh, an extreme amount of crying out for the Lord to move, for his hand to move. And, uh, and we've had some prophetic words, and, and, and they haven't um, come to pass. And that's a whole other ball in and of itself. Um, I think, um, you know, that the Lord's really been sharing with me in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, that 
that we have to war for a prophetic word. When a prophetic word is given and it doesn't come to pass, that we need to war for that. And uh, when we put timelines and time stamps on certain situations, we set ourselves up for failure. And so I've heard a lot of national prophets, you know, delivering words on what they thought was going to happen or what the voice of the, what the word of the Lord was, per se. And, uh, and I don't think a lot of them, some of them gave time stamps, some of them didn't. And so I just want to proceed with caution without coming out and saying uh, the prophets were wrong and throw them, you know, under the bus. Because what happens if, 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 if uh, the president that just left comes into another term? You know, and we say they got it wrong and just, you know, excommunicate them for lack of better terms. You know, when, when we, the Lord is, is wild. I mean, he's awesome. He's wild. He's steady. He's secure. But he doesn't always do things the way that we think that they should be done. And so I, I, I don't want to go out on a limb and say these guys got it all wrong off with their heads. You know, I just want to give it some time. I want to see what the Lord's going to do because uh, he doesn't always move when, when, when we want him to move. And he doesn't always do things the way that we think they should be done. And a lot of times, what appears as one thing is another. And, and uh, so I just want to proceed with caution there. Um, but I, I want to open up with uh, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. And, and I, I don't even know. I just was so heartbroken when, when things went down the way that they went down and they didn't happen the way that I thought that they should happen. And it was because now, in hindsight, the Lord has shown me what has happened was I put my hope in man. I put my hope in man. I put my hope in self. And I, I stopped looking at him. I, I, I forgot to put my hope in him and his plans, his purposes, his kingdom as far as Jesus, you know, being, being my Lord and my Savior. I quit, I took my eyes off of him and started looking at government rule and reign to fix a situation that is only going to be fixed spiritually. It's only going to be fixed through prayer, through perseverance. And uh, this really is, it's an opportunity, you know, in, 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 uh, in James, you know, it's an opportunity for our faith to gain endurance. You know, we need to patiently endure. We need to patiently endure and and I know that sounds easy, but it isn't, it isn't always fun. To patiently endure, to patiently believe. Is my faith going to have endurance? Is, is the thing that I believe in, am I going to keep believing in it, even if it doesn't happen when I want it to? So uh, I just, I've been broken, but I think the good Lord, he's, he's, uh, he's brought some healing some healing to, uh, to me, to my attitude, uh, to my outlook on life. I was so grateful for your message last week, Rod. Uh, recalculate. You said some things that really stimulated thought. And uh, I only know now what I experienced throughout the week is Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when dreams come true, there is life and joy. Now, that's out of the New Living Translation. Uh, the King James Version, it says, Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, but when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. And so, um, what I experienced this past week and what I think a handful of people uh, or a lot of people experienced was hope has been deferred. We had a hope for a certain thing to happen in a certain way, and it didn't happen, and now... Uh, I myself, I can't speak for everybody, but myself was left feeling broken, um, ill, sick to my stomach for a few days, actually. I mean, I, I didn't vomit, but I just wasn't myself. I just felt broken. Like, Lord, did you not hear our prayers? Lord, do you not care? And, uh, and I got a lot of friends that have felt that way, that have, you know, put their hope in... in in Congress and in the House of Representatives and in the Senate and, and then even in the military and then in, you know, um, conspiracy theories. Uh, we all thought, not everybody, but we all had some train of thought. And I can't say that uh, we truly believed things were going to go the way that they went. And then 
when they turned out the way that they have turned out, what do we do? You know, where do we uh, put our hope? Where do we put our faith? You know, it's easy to say we put it in Jesus. It's easy to say we put it in in the Lord God, our Father. You know, but it's uh, sometimes a little more difficult to appropriate or to apply that uh, when you're in the midst of the storm. So the Lord had, uh, you know, in hindsight, hindsight's 2020. He had told me or showed me. He said what had happened was hope has been deferred, and it had made me ill. I was experiencing. I was going through uh, the consequences of hope deferred, and uh, and then again also he just showed me that I put my hope in the wrong thing. You know, I put my hope in in humanity. And that's not necessarily a bad thing to hope for the best and want good in humanity and, and good things to happen. But when that overrides my belief that God is a good father, that's a problem. And uh, so, you know, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me uh, for that. And man, it was brutal. The things that I was thinking, the conversations that I was having within myself and, uh, and the Lord he is so good. You know, in, in my reading throughout the week, he has shown me exactly where I was, exactly where I am, exactly where he is, and exactly where he wants me to be. And so I'm attempting to convey that to, to the body as a whole because I don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like there was a lot of us that uh, were believing a certain way, that are traveling down a certain road, and then, you know, it's easy to put our hope and our faith in self and our hope and our faith in situations and uh, forget that the Lord is in control. And so uh, he took me to Habakkuk chapter 1. Um, so if you want to turn there, you can. If not, I'll read it to you. That's okay. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 4. And uh, these are these are... These are some, I mean, these are almost verbatim, some of the things that I was saying within myself to the Lord. He, he says, uh, Habakkuk's complaint to the Lord here is, How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen. Violence, I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see the sin and misery all around me? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed and useless. There is no justice given in the courts. The wicked far outnumber the righteous, and justice is perverted with bribes and trickery. <laughs> Some of these exact terminology, I mean, I was, I'm just going to be real. I mean, I was in a place to move with violence. I mean, that, I shouldn't say that, you know, the, the guy up here preaching or talking about the Lord should not be saying that stuff, but I'm just as real as I can be. And I was ready to take up arms and, and do whatever needed to be done to, to overthrow whatever needed to be overthrown, and, and, uh, and then it just, the opportunity, never, the opportunity never presented itself, and I feel like I worked myself up for nothing. And, uh, and, and Rod made a statement last week that, that I've heard, I've heard before, but it's just now really starting to resonate with me, and that's that uh, we are a post-Christian nation. You know, I don't know if you guys know it or not, but we are no longer, uh, we're no longer the majority. The, the people that believe in the righteousness and the goodness of God, you know, and the sanctity of life, and 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 uh, you know, righteousness and and truth and justice. We are the minority. We are the minority. I, I never, never dreamed that it would come to that, but I'm beginning to realize that's where we are. You know, there's more people in this nation that would rather live a sinful lifestyle than would rather walk, uh, you know, sanctified of the Lord. And, and that, that alone has been rocking me because who wants to be part of the minority? Who wants to be part of, you know, the losing team, for lack of better terms? I mean, who? I don't. I, I, I want to be a winner. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so that, you know, he made that statement last week, and I've been pondering it all week, that we are in a, 
post, we are a post-Christian nation. That, you know, the, the gospel has been preached in this nation. And, and there's some people that haven't heard, you know, but overall, the gospel of Jesus has been preached in this nation. We are at a point where people have made their decisions. You're going to walk with the Lord or you're not. And walking with the Lord takes courage. It takes strength. It takes endurance. It takes boldness. And, uh, and I just, you know, it's easier. You know, his word says that, that, the, that the road to him, the road to walking with him is narrow, but the gate to destruction is wide. And it, it hurts my heart to, to see that, uh, that the minority is after his righteousness and the majority is after fulfillment of the flesh. <clears throat> um, you know, in, in this, uh, this verse 4, you know, the, the part, A part, you know, how we can put it, verse 4, there, there's, there's two sentences here. Uh, a is, the law has become paralyzed and useless, and there is no justice given in the courts. You know, I, I, I feel like, um, you know, some evidence had been gathered and our courts wouldn't even look at it at all. They wasn't even willing to take a look at it. And, uh, you know, the law, we are where we are in this nation because of lawlessness. We do not like rules and regulations. We don't like speed limits. We don't like anything. We want to do what we want to do. Now, I can't speak for y'all. You know, I'm just overall speaking for the nation, you know, and, and we are where we are because, you know, in the, in the natural, our laws have become paralyzed, you know, um, I, I, I kind of feel like that sometimes spiritually as well, but I'll, I'll stay away from that. <clears throat> and so I found myself complaining to the Lord, you know, and, and that can be a dangerous place. You know, even in complaining to the Lord, he reminded me of the, of, uh, of the spies that came back with a negative report, you know, and the two that had a good report. And... And he reminded me, you know, of, of Moses in Exodus when God told Moses to, uh, you know, go talk to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. And Moses did what he was told, and it didn't happen. And actually, Pharaoh took the straw away from him and said, continue making bricks. You know, I'm going to take away your materials, but I want you to continue with your quota. And, and Moses comes back to God and accuses him, says, you haven't done anything that you said you were going to do. You said you were going to free your people when you haven't done that. And that's a dangerous place to be. I found myself in that position with some of these accusations against the Lord. Almost, almost unfortunately, in a, in a manipulative state. Like, uh, you know, how long, Lord, must I call for your help? Why aren't you doing anything? Don't, don't you love me? You know, don't you love us, your children? You're not going to act on our behalf? What's going on here? And the Lord, in his, in his loving kindness, has uh, gently, gently rebuked me, um, has gently um, steered me back on course. So now I'm in a great place. <laughs> but earlier in the week, not so much. And so uh, in having this, this is an internal conversation now that I'm having with the Lord. Um, and what's so good is he knows our thoughts. He knows our feelings. He knows what we're going through, and that is astonishing in and of itself. So as I'm crying to the Lord, as I'm boo-hooing about not getting my way, he takes me to Psalm chapter 11. You guys can turn there, um, you know, if you'd like. If not, it's okay. I'm going to read it to you. Um, I think this week his word is going to speak for itself. You know, it, it isn't going to take a lot of, you know, dig in into the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the original translations. You know, I'm just going to go through how the Lord was talking to me and how he was reinstilling hope and readjusting my focus, uh, taking it off of, off of self and off of government and realigning it back on him. And, and it's crazy as it didn't take long as once the focus was readjusted and realigned with his plans and his purposes, all of the sorrow, all of the hope deferred, all of the uh, anxiety lifted almost immediately. And so Psalms chapter 11, 
Um, I'll be reading it out of the New Living Translation. It says, I trust in the Lord for protection. So why do you say to me, fly to the mountain for safety? The wicked are stringing their bows and setting their arrows in the bowstrings. They shoot from the shadows at those who do right. The foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? But the Lord is in his holy temple, and the Lord still rules from heaven. He watches everything closely, examining everyone on earth. The Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked. He hates everyone who loves violence, and he rains down blazing coals on the wicked, punishing them with burning sulfur and scorching winds. For the Lord is righteous, and he loves justice. Those who do what is right will see his face. That in a whole has helped me tremendously. If I was going to go through a whole preaching thing, I would probably try to break a lot of that down. Um, but I'll just try to do two kind of briefly. Is uh, 11 verse 3, the foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? This is another question that I found myself asking the Lord. Is uh, We made tremendous headway over the last four years with abortion and with Supreme Court justices being nominated, uh, you know what I'm saying, and, 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 and hopes were growing with the possibility of an overturning of Roe versus Wade, and, and even, I believe Rod brought it up last week, that Missouri has become the first state in the union to not have any abortion uh, clinics that perform abortions. And so we have all of these things going in the right direction. And then... You know what I'm saying? In the course of 48 hours, in the stroke of a pen, everything has changed. And I'm left going, what is going on? And again, kind of, you know, in, in, in Habakkuk's complaint, you know, the Lord had reiterated to me is the foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can the righteous do? I mean, don't get me wrong, we have laws in place but it seems like they're only applying to the righteous people <laughs> because the laws that are in place for the unrighteous people, they do what they want and accuse the righteous of the exact things that they're doing, which again was leaving me in a state of hopelessness. And, you know, as you go through chapter 11, I, I was reading uh, this stuff and, and, you know, he says that the, that the Lord examines both the righteous and the wicked and he hates everyone who loves violence. And he rains down blazing coals on the wicked and, and he punishes them with burning sulfur and scorching winds. And so I had a moment of a glimmer of, I shouldn't, <laughs> but excitement like, yes, get them, Lord, get them. <laughs> and, and, uh, and the Lord ever so gently pulled me off of that, uh, you know, to the last, to the last verse, eleven seven. He said, for the Lord is righteous and he loves justice. Those who do what is right will see his face. You know, up here he says the, the foundations of law and order have collapsed. What can we do? But it says, take heart, the Lord is righteous and he loves justice. He is not going to let things go forever. You know, and, um, <laughs> you know, and it, it, as it seems like we may be... Uh, in a difficult place as a nation, we, we really have to understand that, uh, you know, restoration rides on the back of repentance. And so in these trials and tribulations, it's going to continue to push us to a state of repentance. And, uh, and the Lord is true and just. You know, when, 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 when our people in authoritative uh, positions repent, uh, you know, he, he's going to begin the process of restoration. And, and I just, I believe that, you know, this nation being as young as it is was founded on the values of God and God has a plan for this nation and his plans and his purposes are going to come to pass. You know, with uh, the embassy being moved, um, you know, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you know, in the nation of Israel, that was major. That was major. We are still, uh, I know we may be the minority, but I believe that the Lord still has plans for this nation to be a sheep nation, not to be a goat nation. That there are people that are going to stand on the word of God, that are going to believe in his righteousness. Now, I'm not going to say, you know, 
We're not going to endure struggles. I do believe that there are going to be pockets of judgment released upon this nation, but I don't know that he's going to judge the nation as a whole just yet. This, these last couple statements are personal statements. I can't say that those are the beliefs of everybody as a whole. But God is good. And you know, when he's delivering, when he's bringing nations to repentance, he does have the ability to protect those that are within his will, those that are within his plans and his purposes and that are walking his ways, you know. So we don't have to be fearful, those that are walking hand in hand with the Lord. You know, he's going to create a way. He's going to part the Red Sea, for lack of better terms, for those that are trusting in him fully. Okay, And so, uh, you know, as I got to continue to digest uh, Psalms chapter 11, I made it into the book of Isaiah somehow. No, no, no particular reading plan. I just, in spending time with the Lord, uh, I don't even know how it happens. He just gets you into places and you begin reading and he just begins to really speak as you spend time with him, if, uh, if, if, you, if you don't know that the, that the voice of the Lord speaks to you, I want you to understand that first and foremost, he speaks to you through his word. I mean, crystal clear. When you, when you take a little bit of time to read his word, just open up, open up the Bible. You don't have to go anywhere in particular. You just start somewhere and he'll meet you where you are. Open it up and start reading. And his Holy Spirit will breathe on those words. And he, he will make things uh, meaningful to you and applicable for you. And it is so astonishing. When he took me out of Psalms chapter 11, I ended up over in uh, Isaiah 51. And I'm going to read uh, verses 12 through 16. And, and again, I can't say that all of this, I mean, I, I see how it ties together. But I can't see how it ties together particularly as a pinpoint, bullet point message. This was just a conversation that the Lord was having with me. I was having with him. I was complaining to him, and he was showing me how to stop complaining and start putting my hope back in him. And so uh, in Isaiah 51, verses uh, 12 through 16, the whole chapter of Isaiah 51 is actually letterheaded, a call to trust the Lord, which that in and of itself helped me tremendously because I found myself losing trust in the Lord. Again, because I was looking at circumstances and situations. So uh, if you feel like reading all of 51, please do. It's an amazing chapter. So uh, 51 verse 12, it says, I, even I, am the one who comforts you. So why are you afraid of mere humans who wither like grass and disappear? Yet you have forgotten the Lord, your creator, the one who put the stars in the sky and established the earth. Will you remain in constant dread of human oppression? Will you continue to fear the anger of your enemies from morning till night? Soon all of you captives will be released. Imprisonment, starvation, and death will not be your fate. For I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea, causing its waves to war. My name is the Lord Almighty. And I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely within my hand. I set all the stars in space and established the earth. I am the one who says to Israel, you are mine. Now, as I was reading this, you know, I, I knew that I didn't know, but the Holy Spirit told me to address that part right there that says, I am the one who says to Israel, you are mine. Because a lot of us can get caught up with this is a specific word to a specific people in a specific time. And you have to understand that in Romans chapter 11, the Lord has engrafted us wild olive branches into the root. The root, we the Gentiles are the wild olive branches that have been grafted into the root, which is Israel. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So this too would be applicable to us. And again, this is a conversation that the Lord is having with me within myself. He's encouraging me, you know, I seen uh, the president take office, and uh, I begin dreading human oppression. 
You know what I'm saying? I, I do honestly believe that the church is about to come into a season of persecution. And what does that look like? I have no idea. But my mind ran wild with what it's going to look like. And what am I going to do? And, you know, what happens in the ATF knocks at my door? And, and what am I going to do here? And how am I going to get food? And, and they're censoring all my social media and, and all of these wild things. I mean, my mind just started running rampant. And the Lord, in his mercy, in his love, because, because I am his son, you are his son, you are his daughter, he loves you. He is a good father, and he will not allow craziness to roll through your mind without addressing it. However, you need to make yourself uh, available, given the opportunity for him to speak to you. Because in, 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 in our distress in our frustration or aggravation, if I had not turned to his word, I would still be rolling these thoughts through my head. You know what I'm saying? And by now, they would have been out of control. I'd probably been locked in my bunker like a tweaker with a loaded bunch of guns waiting for him to kick the door in so I could shoot everybody. But thank you, Lord, that, that you know what I'm saying? He, he's like, if... If you need to hear from the Lord, go to his word. I mean, we have awesome brothers and sisters that we can confide in, that the Lord flows through. But I'm telling you, if you need to hear for yourself, not from a friend, not, not, not with my opinion, you know what I'm saying? Not through my filters or my opinions, but just a true word from the Lord, open his word. Open his word. I'm telling you again, he'll meet you where you are. So uh, I just thank you. I thank you there at the end, you know, in, in 16, in Isaiah 51, 16, you know, he says that the, the Lord says he has hidden me safely within his hand. I don't have anything to worry about. And I don't know that I was worried about for myself. <laughs> I was worried about for the other people that were going to encounter me. <laughs> uh so, you know, in, in continuing with this, you know, in, in my readings, I, you know, I just kept rolling through Isaiah. And, and again, the Lord uh, had me stop at Isaiah 55. And originally I had wrote down uh, just, a, just a couple of scriptures here through I, Isaiah 55. But, but this morning, as I was kind of reviewing some of this stuff, I felt like the Lord said, go, go ahead and lay down the whole chapter. And so... I'm going to read this whole chapter and I'm going to believe that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you where you are. You know, there's going to be things that are, that are for you, that are appropriated for you, and there's going to be things that maybe aren't. And if it isn't for you, don't worry about it. And if it is for you, then worry about it. But, you know, again, actually, um, how I got to this is, as the Lord started sharing with me once he told me that I'm in his hand, you know, he set the stars in the sky and that I am in his hand he started telling me, my ways aren't your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, we've heard this come out of this pulpit multiple times in the last six months. And so the Lord again brought me back over to that, and it's in Isaiah 55. And, you know, the, the, the letterhead to this is invitation to the Lord's salvation. And if I just ponder that, you know, the Lord is inviting us into his salvation, into his protection, into his redemption. You know, that I don't have to look for salvation uh, from legislature and laws and, and, and friends. And, and as much as I want to, I don't have to find salvation in rounds of ammunition. I don't have to. <laughs> I find my salvation in the Lord. And so uh, I'm just going to read this uh, out of the New Living Translation. Uh, because like I said, his word, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go out and come back void. His word achieves the purposes that he wants to achieve. So, is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen, I will tell you where to get food that is good for the soul. Come to me with your ears wide open. Listen, for the life of your soul is at stake. I am ready to make an everlasting covenant with you. 
I will give you all the miracles and an unfailing love that I promised David. He displayed my power among the nations. You also will command the nations and they will come running to obey because I, the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, have made you glorious. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him while he is still near. Let the people turn from their wicked deeds. Let them banish from their minds the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God for he will abundantly pardon My thoughts are completely different from yours, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and the snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing the seed for the farmer and the bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I sent it out and it always produces fruit. It will always accomplish all that I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere that I send it. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and the hills will burst into songs, and the trees of the field will clap their hands. Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where briars grew, myrtles will sprout up. This miracle will bring great honor to the Lord's name, and it will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. There is so much in that chapter if you was to unpack verse by verse what the Lord is saying. But to me, he was telling me his ways are not my ways. That his ways far surpass anything that I could even imagine or conceive. And, 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 and it took the focus off of self and, 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 and fear of the unknown or fear of what's coming, and how am I going to protect my family, and what about my friends, and all of this stuff, and it put it back on the one who gave me all of that stuff. It put it back on him, and, 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 he, and he let me know, you know, that, that I'm going to live in, with joy and peace. And I was not in a place of peace over the last few days, um, you know, especially after the 20th. You know, there was great expectation and then a great letdown. <laughs> Just being real. Again, that, that, that was for me, you know. And, uh, but I'm going to live in joy, and I'm going to live in peace. And all the things are going to happen. All this stuff is going to happen, and, and these are going to be an everlasting sign of his power and his love. You know, and, and, and so, of course, when spending time with the Lord and, 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 and he's revealing things to you, The Holy Spirit opens up one scripture that takes you to another scripture. And it takes you to another scripture. And it takes you all over the place. And before long, through his word, he's having a conversation with you. But it took me to, uh, I had to stop for a moment. And and I had to go silent. And I had to listen. (laughs) I had to read with my mouth closed. (laughs) And give him an opportunity to speak instead of just laying my requests at his feet, giving him the opportunity to share his heart with me was a very, very, very big key. And, it, and, and, and where it says, you will live in joy and peace, verse 12 there, he immediately the Holy Spirit took me to uh, Psalm 1611. So you can turn there with me if you'd like. And uh, this is a scripture that I've learned to love and I've learned to not love at the same time. <laughs> um, in a, in a uh, what do you call it? In a paraphrase, a paraphrase, I'm going to read it too, but a paraphrase, Psalm 1611 says, there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. And the Lord just told me in, in, in Isaiah 55 that I'm going to live a life of joy and peace. And he says, uh, you know, Psalm 1611, there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. And whenever I was bummed out, I had a friend that used to tell this to me all the time. And while it's very true and factual, I wanted to strangle him. Because when I'm having a pity party, I don't want to be encouraged. <laughs> I just want you to join in with me on the pity party, and we can be pitiful together. <clears throat> so, but he's so true. It's, it's so tru- true. There's, there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. If, if, um, l- let me just read it to you. 
So in the New Living Translation, it says, You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. In the King James, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Again, that's a loaded passage because at the Father's right hand is Jesus, who's forever interceding on our behalf. You know, when he's, he actually says that, you know, at his right hand there are pleasures evermore. The pleasures evermore are actually Yeshua, are actually Jesus, you know. But there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. If I'm not experiencing a fullness of joy, again, you know, um, maybe I'm not in the Lord's presence. Because when you get in the presence of the Lord, all of that shame, all of the guilt, all of the anxiety, all of the frustration, all of that stuff melts away in his presence. Because that's not who he is, you know. So uh, the, the Lord just let me know, you know, that we are going to live, those that are walking with the Lord. If you were generally, I mean, uh, not generally, Genuinely, if you are genuinely, not generally, <laughs> you are genuinely walking with the Lord, then you are going to live a life of joy and peace. And uh, if you're not living a life of joy and peace, maybe we're not in His presence. Now, I don't want to be um, blind to the fact, you know, that the enemy sometimes sends things our direction, or life does happen. Um, but if we can redirect our focus somehow, some way to the Lord, he, he makes a way for it to all pan out. It all dissipates. And, uh, you know, sometimes there's things that we have to apply to our lives. For instance, the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is there for everybody, but if you do not apply it to yourself, it is useless to you. You know, knowledge is another thing, you know, um, the knowledge of wisdom is one of the seven spirits of God. You know, the spirit of wisdom. Knowing, he says, he says, my people will perish for lack of knowledge. You know, what, what Miss Nancy brought forth today, not everybody knows that. You know, not everybody knows that in Exodus, he says, the sins of the Father will be passed down to the third and the fourth generations. But the blessings of the Father will be handed down to over a hundred generations. You know, and, and, and what, the, what the world that we live in calls hereditary you know, alcoholism, diabetes, uh, cancer. These are just generational curses that can be broke, you know? What's it say in, in, in Revelations? I believe it's Revelations. Uh, it's either Revelations 12, 11 or, or Revelations 11, 12. It says, we're set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. You know, that they loved their lives, not even unto death. You know, we're set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, and, and we have to come to a place where our lives are more important for his kingdom than they are for our own pleasures. Are we willing to lay down our lives for him and his kingdom? Because all of his apostles did, you know? And I'm not saying that we're all apostles. I'm just saying that, you know, he says if you, if you lose your life, you'll find it. And if you cling to your life, you'll lose it. Whew. So uh, after, after he shared with me that there's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord and, and I'm not experiencing this joy because I have pulled myself out of his presence and allowed myself to experience the cares of this world, <laughs> he got me back over to Isaiah, Isaiah 42, Isaiah 42, verses uh, 10 through 17 is what I'm going to read. And again, this is, these, these, so much of this stuff, I'm telling you, could be broke down and really go to town. Like, like my brother Nathan has an amazing way to break things down and bring another perception, you know, bring another way to see things. He he goes deep into some of his studies that are really awesome, that, that really help me, that push me. The deeper he digs, the deeper I want to dig. It's like, I mean, I know it's not there, but he shares something, and I'm like, well, I'm gonna, I got to find something even deeper than that. You, you know what I'm saying? And, 
it, there's, there's this brotherly thing there that's, that's so awesome. Um, but in this, you know, we, we said some things a, a year and a half, maybe two years ago, you know, that, that, that we're going to sing a new song unto the Lord. And then there was that song that came out, new wine in the crushing and the pressing. You know, he's creating new wine. And, you know, all these uh, Chad, you know, Chad Getz showed up from Echo and had a prophetic word for this church as a whole that the Lord was creating new wine, and, and it, we were kind of in a difficult time. We didn't understand it, but we, we made it. You know, we, we pressed through. And so uh, Isaiah 42, 10 through 17, uh, this is letterheaded here, a song of praise to the Lord. A song of praise to the Lord. And so in this conversation with the Lord of how much everything is horrible and how he's readjusting my uh, eyesight to focus back on him, he reminds me there is so much... Uh, that we have to praise him for. You know, and actually when I got to this, a song of praise to the Lord, the Lord reminded me to enter his courts with praise and thanksgiving. When I'm going to come to him and make my petitions about how the world is horrible, I should come with praise and thanksgiving first. <laughs> and again, it was an ever so gentle rebuke. You know, it was done with a loving hand. And, and when you respond to the loving rebuke, you don't have to experience the belt. Because I don't like the belt. Uh, but sometimes that's all I respond to. <laughs> so I'm just going to read this to you again, Isaiah uh, 42, uh, 10 through uh, 17. Uh, I'll be reading out of the New Living Translation. It says, Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing his praises from the ends of the earth. Sing all who sail the seas all you who live in distant coastlands, join in the chorus, you desert towns. Live in the, or I'm sorry, let the villages of Kadur rejoice. Let the people of Selah sing for joy. Shout praises from the mountaintops. Let the coastlands glorify the Lord. Let them sing his praise. The Lord will march forth like a mighty man. He will come out like a warrior, full of fury. He will shout his thundering battle cry and he will crush all his enemies. He will say, I have been silent. Yes, I have restrained myself, but now I will give full vent to my fury. I will gasp and pant like a woman giving birth. I will level the mountains and the hills and I will bring blight on all their greenery. I will turn the rivers into dry land and I will dry up all the pools. I will lead blind Israel down a new path guiding them along an unfamiliar way. I will make the darkness bright before them and smooth out the road ahead of them. Yes, I will indeed do these things and I will not forsake them. But those who trust in idols, calling them their gods, will be turned away in shame. Now, when I read this, again, I got super excited because finally my Savior, my God, my Lord, was bringing the thunder. <clears throat> he was going to rain down on the injustices of the world. And I'm like, yes! Yes! You know? And, uh, and again, he, he, I, I really want to, again, reiterate, you know, that, that I understand, you know, that there's a lot of Isaiah that was written in a specific time to a specific people to, for a specific pur purpose. But the Lord, again, constantly is reminding me that in Romans 11, we are engrafted in, you know? And, and if you keep going through, I, I'm, I might be Romans 12, the turnover. Um, I'm not for sure. Don't hold me to that. But at the end of 11, you know, he says, for, for, for those that have been grafted in, not to become puffed up with pride, because it's only until the fullness of Gentiles has been um, accounted for that then all of Israel will be saved. And for us to not think of ourselves more highly than, than his original, you know, what the Bible calls his firstborn is Israel. And that, that we get the opportunity to be grafted into that, you know. And it, he, he was going to make straight the paths of Israel. And, and again, this was a conversation from the Lord to me. You know, I, I can't say that these are 1,000% for you, but I just felt like what I went through, so many of my brothers and sisters have also been going through. Just a, a, a feeling of what do we do now? Or what next? 
Well, the same thing we've been doing forever, holding on to the promises of the Lord. <laughs> you know, praying for salvations, lifting our brothers and sisters up, uh, encouraging them, walking them through deliverance, breaking the chains of bondage. I mean, the same thing. We don't, you know, just because uh, something didn't happen the way that I thought that it should happen doesn't mean that I tuck tail and run. It means you press in some more. You keep on pressing in. So, uh, and then last but not least, the Lord had me go all the way back to the beginning, which was Proverbs 13, 12. Which I'm, I'm you know, that's what we opened up with. And I'm going to go back there. Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when dreams come true, there is life and joy. And so, the beginning, the Lord showed me where I had hope deferred, and it had taken me to a nasty place. But then over the course of all these passages of, you know, Psalms 11 and all through Isaiah, He has restored hope. He has given me hope again that He has not turned a blind eye, and He has seen, He has heard our prayers, He has seen where we are, and when the time is just right, He's going to move on our behalf. When the time is just right, He's going to move in a way that's going to blow us away. It's going to be more than we can conceive, more than we could possibly fathom. You know, just in Isaiah 55, His ways are not our ways. You know, His thoughts are not our thoughts. They're higher. They're, they're more than we could possibly conceive. And so, with that, He, he, take me from, he took me from heart deferred but when dreams come true, there is life and joy. You know, the second part, when dreams come true, there's life and joy. So the dream maybe yet hasn't come to full fruition, but I can have life, I can have joy. Where do I go for joy? The presence of the Lord. There's fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. So this week has been a, um, it's been an awesome week. It's been a horrible week. You talk about extreme highs and lows, which seems like every week is anymore. Um, the Lord, He will not, He loves you. Everybody in here, if you're feeling down and out in any way, shape, or form, He loves you. He's not going to let you roll around in the muck and mire if you let Him. You know, give yourself an opportunity to hear Him speak. Put yourself in a position to hear His word. Give Him a shot. You know, if you, if you want to stay in the muck and the mire, he'll let you stay there. <laughs> but I don't think any of us really want to stay there. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just asking you to take some time to get with the Lord on your own. I mean, don't get me wrong. Fellowship is amazing. Fellowship is amazing. And hearing, you know, what's going on in my brother's and my sister's life. But there is nothing better than going to the Father himself. I mean, that's what Jesus came and died for. A reconciliation, a restoration to the Father's presence. You know, the presence left the garden when sin, Jesus came, died, his blood, atonement for our sins so that we could access the Father. Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf so that we can have relationship with the Father. I mean, we have a relationship with Jesus too. Don't get me wrong, Jesus is amazing. The whole purpose was to go to the Father. And so, uh, <clears throat> give yourself a chance. Go climb in Dad's lap. I I, uh, I didn't even get to his lap. I just fell down at his feet, and he said, let me help you get up. <laughs> and uh, so, so with that being said, if, 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 if there's anybody in here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he would love to meet you today. I mean, it, we, we read, you know, in, in the salvation, you know, seek the Lord while he may be found. And today, he is able to be found. I think there's going to be a point in time where the choices that we make, we're going to be stuck with. <laughs> there will be a time where we don't get to make that choice anymore. You know, when you're dead, you can't make that choice. You make the choice now. So uh, with, with, with all of that being said, we're going to, we're going to have a few more worship songs. And um, Miss, Miss Nancy, will you please come? I mean, when, when we're doing our worship, if anybody has anything that they need healed of or want prayed for. Brandon, you too.
if Miss Nancy and Miss Brand, Mr. Brandon, <laughs> if Mr. Brandon and Miss Nancy would come up here for, I'm telling you, anybody that has anything that they need healed of, I so witnessed, I was, the spirit in me was witnessing with what you were saying about healing. When you started speaking, I'm like, oh my gosh, the, the, you know, you know the presence of the Lord? Well, the, the Lord is here. He's here now. He's here all the time. He's here with us. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. And anytime we get together in corporate unity, there's a greater manifestation of a spirit. Don't be afraid. I mean, I'm telling you, he loves you. But there, there's, you're in a safe house. You're in a safe house. So if you need prayer for anything, please come up here and get prayed for. If, if you don't know the Lord and you want to know the Lord, please ask, how do I meet the Lord? <laughs> I mean, we're all in this together. We're sharing lives because we love each other. Is, you know, we're here not for ourselves. We're here for each other. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna do a couple of worship songs, and 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 uh, if if my two friends could come up here and and pray with anybody that needs healing, and please don't be afraid. Come on up here. I mean, so I'm gonna pray real quick, and then we're gonna get at it. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for relationship. Lord, I thank you for relationship. I thank you, Lord, that you love each and every one of us, that you love us right where we are, that you will never leave us nor forsake us, <laughs> that there isn't anything that shakes you. While the, while the world, while our lives are shaking, there's nothing that shakes you. And Lord, I thank you that we can put our hope, our trust, and our faith in you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to refocus or, or, or realign or recalculate the way that we are seeing things and bring us into uh, your plans and your purposes. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be great ambassadors of your kingdom. And Lord, I ask that you, would, uh, that you would be with us as we go through this week and that you would help us to advance your kingdom. Help us to make your name great. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.